It's an honor to welcome you to this second plenary of uh, the FIG Congress. The plenary session's title is Modern Technology Usage for Our Profession, and we have three very distinguished speakers today. I think it's a lot of discussion about last night. I hope you all had a wonderful last night at the traditional Turkish evening. Some good food and great music. We'll start off uh, this morning plenary session with the first speaker. That will be Dr. Jürgen Dold, is a geosystems, a hexagon geosystems president. A short introduction to Jürgen will be with close to 30 years of experience in the geospatial industry. Dr. Dold serves as Hexagon's Geosystem Division President. He directs the organization's global strategy in measurement technology, leading 5,000 professionals in more than 40 countries. Previous to this role, Dold served in many positions within the organization from product manager to division president. He also served as academic counsel and as his assistant professor at the Institute of Photogrammetry and Image Processing at the Technical University Braunschweig where he oversaw research and development for various projects, including an expedition across the Greenland ice sheets. Not many of us have actually been to Iceland. Uh, Greenland, it's very nice to see the ice there. Dold holds a PhD in engineering and serves on the boards of the Civil and Environmental and Geomatic Engineering Department of the ETH Zürich and the engineering planning and consultancy company Basler and Hoffmann. His presentation has the title, Transformation Through Digitalization. I'm looking very much forward to listening to this one. Please. Good morning. How are you? Good. I'm very excited to, that's pretty loud. Um, I don't need to speak too loud. I think you can hear me that way too. I'm very excited to be here at FIG. I'd be honored to be invited to talk to you and have the opportunity. And when I see the theme of FIG, where we talk about smart worlds, where things are connected, I think this is a great opportunity for our industry. And that's the reason I have chosen my topic, transformation through digitalization. And there are three elements that I think are very important for us to think about is, we are the generation, we are, whether we are students, we have it all in front of us, or we are in leading positions in companies, um, we have the responsibility to develop the full potential of smart things. They come through digital technologies. And I think our profession is very exposed to digital technology. And with that, we create new realities, new things we have not seen before. And I was thinking is we have a room full of surveyors. And let me ask you, who from you is from government? Who from you is from universities? Who is from private sectors? Where are the students? And you know, what we learn first is the students, the new millennials, they start later the day. So we should have those sessions later in the day. So we have not too many. However, you are the future. You are the future of our profession because you will see so much change going on that you will drive that and adapt it to our industry. And I was thinking, having a room full of surveyors, what example could I take to basically explain what I mean with new realities? And I was thinking about the reality of laundry. Well, you were wondering why. Who does this laundry himself? Well, and that's the reason most of it's digitalized. And thinking about this, Thinking about reality 1.0 in laundry, what was it? The Kaufmans at that time didn't wonder about laundry. They were thinking about new clothes to basically find an animal to kill, to have a new jacket. And then we basically, the reality 2.0 started to basically, it was a community event. Women at the river, women 
Oh, that goes fast here. Um, women at the river, then we brought it in-house. Then the first factories were built, where basically it was automated for the upper classes, for hotels and so forth, to automate it. Well, it was still lots of manual work, but it was the industrialization that then brought us the laundry into our homes. Today we see it digitalized, kind of digitalizing in terms of apps that steer the machine, you know when it should start, or machines that basically fold up your clothes and everything is ordered in your closet. But what is 4.0 reality in laundry? Think about a closet that basically detects how much soil you have on your clothes, detects whether it's silk or cotton, and makes everything automatic. So it's your wardrobe management system, as you would say. Well, we don't know what happens in that industry forward. We were surprised in many applications. But I think when we think about digitalization and digitize, I see often that words are interchangeable use. And I would like to create a definition. To digitize something is converted in ones and zeros. Just because you use a fax machine, you're not digitalized. Just because you take a digital image that you store somewhere, you're not digitalized. So what is the difference between digitizing and to digitalize? The most obvious difference is the AL, right? That's in the word. But digitalizing means you are doing something with this digital world. You fully automate certain processes. You, you do processes different than before, right? And I think one example or two, a couple of examples where it has hit our daily life is um, think about traveling. I have one risk mitigation rule when I'm traveling. There's one thing I will never lose. That's my passport. I have it always with me. Um, that's my security to come home at the weekends if everything else would be gone. But now you go on to the first immigration places where you basically see iris detections. Who wants to scan his eye and make it sure it's available in the internet? Well, if you go faster through immigration lines because your iris is known, you want to be there. I tell you, there are a couple of countries you want to be on the fast line. And there is an automation going on that I think this digitalization brings with us. And think about um, going a step further. There's another part in my mitigation rule. I have always my credit card with me, right? So passport and credit card makes sure wherever I am lost, I come home, right? You find an airplane, you go back, and so forth, you have your passport. But the digitalization in the finance industry has moved much forward. It's kind of cash having with you, it's one part, but it has basically vanished more or less because everyone has a credit card with himself. And the next step is basically that your iPhone or your phone is used. Now having face recognition, fingerprint recognition on your iPhone will automate these things. And think about the millenniums of this world, what do they never lose? They may lose the passport, they may lose the credit card, but they never ever lose their iPhone or their phones. Because they look at this every five minutes, if not more, right? So think about this. There are changes going on that fundamentally change the behavior where we are moving forward. So when I think about the digitalization, I think about that these, um, yeah, coming on. Can you hit the button, please? It's a nice video, but it's not so nice. Yeah, okay, here it is. Um, the, when I think about digitalization, it's really about this AL. It's two letters that help us, because something is digitized, to really digitalize it, to really make it as it should be. Not as it has been, but as it should be. Going forward, um, I understand that some of us, or most of us, I would say most of us, are thinking about digitalization. But many of us think about this, what does it mean in terms of complexity? Is there any risk of doing it different? 
are there accidents possible because we digitalize something or delays or even mistakes in the process? Yes, I do agree. There is a certain chance that things go wrong if you do a process completely different. But however, this industry moves forward and there's a very easy saying, it's kind of a rule in life. Those that stand still will lose. Those that move forward, they will win. And it's in many applications which we see. It's, it is in the private life and it is in industry side and so forth. So the question is that I have always, when we see these technologies adapting in our own world, we are digitizing our images, we are basically making face recognition so we find grandma and, and children in, in the data sets automatically. Are we applying as decision makers in this industry, are we applying the same rules in the same speed to our professional life? And I think this is something which I would urge everyone here, whether he's a decision maker or a young student who has his entire career in front of him, is take that in. Our generation that makes certain decisions in this company, they will fruit in 10 years if it's a transformational thing. And we need to make certain decisions today to go forward and to be relevant in the future. I think this digitalization creates enormous potential and I have chosen two examples that's more relevant to our industry than laundry um, to explain what I mean, what is going on and what I can observe in this industry. The first is about digitizing cities, creating digital models of cities and what can we do with this. Digitizing cities is, has started, I think, um, Photogrammetry is many, many years old and scanning maybe 20, 20, 30 years old. But I think only lately this technology became not any more exclusive. It is now inclusive. You find many affordable solutions to digitize cities or landmarks like here in Pisa to make it available in the digital world. And it rapidly it rapidly accelerates. There's more and more technologies is there, and it's not anymore an exclusive thing to digitize a landmark. It goes that far that there is now technologies available that you put kind of these mobile mapping systems, and we see one in the front of the door when you come in, which are equipped with lasers and imaging technologies. But I do believe there is an uh, opportunity for radar solutions. So what we see in the mobile mapping system is uh, above the ground, we see the point cloud, but the radar system, ground penetrating radar, can detect the pipes below the street. And suddenly by mapping a street, a, a city or the streets in the city in a different way, you create data sets that's not only interesting for one profession. It's for multiple professions, for the construction industry, for the land management planning and so forth. The development of digital cities from air has rapidly improved. There are projects on the way which were at the beginning driven by the Googles and so forth to digitize um, cities from air. Um, now there are programs out, professional programs out where um, cities are captured in, uh, in, on a yearly base um, in 3D. There's different methods where you take those 3D models out of imaging data, um, lately radar data, lately fused imaging radar data, where you not create only a mesh, but also objects which you have seen in this video where you can exchange objects for land management and simulation. I believe this technology, as maybe, is exclusive still for some of the cities. It's becoming the new normal. Every city will have it, and you can visualize things going forward. Um, you could say now, ah, what do we do all with this data, right? What is 2.5 quintillion? What is it? It's a digit with 19, it's a number with 19 digits. And it's the data that are created every single day also today. And what I mean with this is there's an entire IT industry that makes sure we can handle those data and stream those data. But only if we go a step further is not 
the data, the mass of data should make it create a challenge for us. It's more how we use this data smartly. That is one, the important part. It's not just collecting data. If you just collect the data and put the data in the storage, it is bureaucracy. You know, have no, no use for it. So use this da uh, data smart. And we are basically having uh, this example, which I would like to share with you. This is an uh, example where we uh, created a 3D city model of uh, Sao Paulo just before the Olympic Games. It was kind of a project where a city modeler, a city, airborne city mapper was used to create basically the 3D city models of the surroundings of the Olympic um, events. Um, and then what we did is com combine those with uh, mobile mapping data um, on streets, street views with point clouds, but also indoor mapping devices to basically collect the entire part. This data set was primarily used for the um, uh, public safety group to use that. And just having the data doesn't really bring the value. You need now to add to this data um, certain uh, intelligent, uh, with that you augment these 3D datas with intelligence, and this is a real-time feed of data where people are, smartphones. Remember I said everyone has a smartphone? So we know where people are, and we can basically redirect security teams to the places where basically the events and the crowds are happening. And if you look at this picture, everyone in the forces on the ground understand where these places are. Augmenting reality is an important part of, um, of the, maybe the next slide, please. It's coming. Yep. No, that was too fast. Now we were clicking at the same time. Yep, so now I'm controlling and excellent. Um, so now the other example is when we use these 3D data, then we can use them also to simulate certain what-if scenarios. What-if scenarios um, that get a higher quality if you have 3D data. So look at this one. This is a noise pollution simulation um, shown on a map. What is wrong? What is wrong with this map? It's too deep. But if you change that to the same 3D model which we had to basically visualize the buses or trains going through the city, you can now make the analysis through a kind of a dynamic process where things are connected. The 3D model is connected with the noise pollution simulations to really show kind of where do you have the largest noise pollution and so forth. And you can use this for multiple other things, is heavy duty transports. There are cities around the world where are close to, uh, to harbors. They have 70,000 heavy duty transports through the city. So you can calculate profiles on the bridges and so forth. So it is a data set that is available for many disciplines. However, just for a noise pollution simulation, you would not be able to afford such a city model. And that's where the sharing economy kicks in. And the sharing economy means that you have data like sitting around on, on the table and sitting around that you have multiple disciplines, city planners, uh, public safety, construction, those who are responsible for the road, those who are responsible for the power, and so forth. If you create for them kind of a data set that everyone can use, freely use with the right technologies to do simulations and so forth. That uh. I can speak. Oh, oh, good. Thank you. You bring me back. I thought I have to speak louder. Um, good. The sharing economy is one part. So there are multiple ingredients that we need in order to make these 3D city models bring it to life. It is one, we need visualization with simplicity so everyone can use it is augmenting it with intelligence just to digitize is no value. You add it with the intelligence. And I think we as sign uh, people who are coming from en our engineers, I've studied on that part, we understand all these technologies. I think where it's more getting difficult is the sharing economy. 
how do we share, what policies do we introduce, and so forth. And here are things where I believe if the sharing economy means that everyone profits from it, it's those who are using it, those who are basically managing the data sets, those that are recording the data sets, and those who are developing the technologies to use, to manage, and to record that. Um, and there are some challenges in, with open data and so forth, and I'm fully behind open data. I understand what it means, but I think it's a big word. But somehow there is a risk that certain economies, sharing economies, are destroyed because if there's no motivation to bring better out technologies and to update it faster, if there's no benefits for that, then there is the sharing economy does not allow to go forward. Good. Going to the second example is the digitalization of construction industry. The digitalization of the construction industry has the challenge that <laughs> it is while the manufacturing industry has increased the productivity, the construction industry stays in the best case flat, if not declining. There's too much waste going on. And that means there is a need to basically improve and digitalize the construction ecosystem. The process from the design to the plan to the control has to be automated. And it is a digital integrated process. Um, there are solutions out that basically manage kind of from measuring the as-is situation into the design, going from the design into the reality and so forth. And what I would like to share with you a couple of examples where technology can really help in a new way is indoor mapping systems. For Think about renovation. If you have a place where you have no plan, then today with your mobile mapping systems, which may be a backpack or other devices, you can go into a building. This is an example where basically somebody walked with a backpack mobile mapping system through the building in 30 minutes, and then after another hour, he gets the floor, gets the floor plan. So now you have your ass built where architects can base their Design not on assumptions, it is on the reality. That's the first part. That's the digitizing at the beginning. The digitalization happens then when the next slide would come. Can you get me the next slide? Uh, not the same slide again. Can you press one forward? It's a nice one, but I didn't want to show it three times. So, okay, this is now the application when you digitize the object, then it also goes into the CAD systems. In the CAD systems, you have now the 3D world, and the architects can basically adapt on that their plans to fit them to the real world. It's processes that are basically automated from an interfacing reading in and using these point clouds in the design. Then you will have software that basically manages every single step in this process. Not only kind of what has to be done when, but also kind of cost parameters and so forth. And then there is an important that these data sets are not staying only in the office, it's connected to the outside world. Because there's many trades on the construction place where then basically need to get those information. What has to be done? Where has it to be placed? Where is the cut model? And then where is the surveying coming in again? While at the beginning you surveyed the asses, now it's about transforming these data sets into the real world. The real world means that you take the point clouds, uh, that you um, means that you take the design into the field with these total stations, stake out those points, and then basically verify where it, is, where it was. The last example here is I believe that construction progress documentation is of value. If you think about the construction sites, then they, you have so many trades that everything exactly built where it should be is nearly impossible. Therefore, construction progress documentation is, is an important part. Um, we have developed kind of a simplicity-driven scanner um, that basically allows you for architects and everyone to basically use this device as one button. And what it creates is basically creates 3D scenes, which you would see 
on this one. You see on the right side, um, on the lower right side, you see you go to a certain floor plan, and then you get basically kind of a walkthrough through the building. Through the combination of imaging and 3D point clouds, it creates a 3D model. And if you do this during the phase of the construction, you basically have a construction progress documentation, which is then a good base also for facility management during the life cycle of a building. Important in this industry is that we combine simplicity, because suddenly people we use measurement devices, they are not surveyors. But therefore it needs to be simplicity driven, it needs to be 100% connected, and the intelligence of all the processes have to come together. And that's a huge potential for our industry to go forward. I get the next slide. So, what I wanted to show with this was these two letters, the AL, right? They make the difference. They will make change the work we work forever. Digitizing is something which we know. Digitalization needs a mindset change. It's let's do things differently than we have done it before. And so I think myself, um, when we go from the digitize, um, then we see kind of there's lots of applications out there, whether in construction, in utility markets, uh, even body scanners out there, right? But the important is for us, what hinders us? What hinders us to go forward? I think there is a vast reservoir of digital data. We are creating them, tons. But what is hindering us to digitalize? Are these walls between departments? Are these walls on dams that hold the water back? Is it the ideas that are not floating? I don't think so. It's, it's just the mindset where, we, where I believe we need to go forward. The mindset to drive change. And I think the leaders of this industry, they have the responsibility to detect the potential in the area, to be the catalyst of understanding what technologies are there and can be used to drive change. And to really embrace these digital technologies to create new realities for our industry. And um, I think digitizing is something which we do perfect. Digitalize is something which we need to drive forward. And I see when I saw your theme, about um, embracing these kind of smart worlds and moving forward. I wish you a lot of inspiring meetings here and uh, wish you a lot of success digitalizing this world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jürgen. We'll, we'll save some time in the end to, to, to have some questions, I hope, so please prepare your questions. Uh, we'll move on to the next presenter immediately. This will be uh, Dr. Ong Si Liang. Uh, his presentation is called ICMS, Global Consistency in Measurement and Reporting Construction Cost. Uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Ong by saying he has an illustrious career spanning over 40 years in, in, in both the uh, public and private sector. Dr. Ong was the president of the Royal Institution of Surveyors Malaysia and chairman of the Pacific Association of Quantity Surveyors in the past. He was also the 130th global president of the Royal Institution of Surveyors. And he, in his uh, inauguration in July 2011, there was a historic event as he was the first non-British, first Asian and first Malaysian to be elected as the global president of RICS. Currently, he's the chairman of FIG Commission for Construction, Economics, and Man Management, that is Commission 10, and he's also the elected chairman of the Standard Setting Committee for International Construction Measurement Standards, ICMS. So please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor and privilege to be able to stand before you at this plenary session. In 2012, when I first attended the FIG Working Week in Rome, I saw a massive crowd of surveyors, but I can count within my own one hand, there are very few surveyors who are called quantity surveyors. And um, 
when I first was appointed as the chair for Commission 10, I whispered to the new president then, uh, Professor Chrissy, I said, you know, we should make surveyors involved in construction more relevant, more prominent uh, at the FIG uh, congresses or at FIG Working Week. And she took that very much at heart and over the last four years, she had been very actively promoting surveyors in construction. And at this very congress, she purposely and intentionally make it a point that a plenary session where a surveyor involved in construction is, is, uh, is one of the speakers. So thank you, Chrissy, uh, for your acknowledgement of the contributions of surveyors involved in construction. Today, I'm going to talk about ICMS, something which is very close to my heart. And in fact, I've been looking at this issue for the past 20 years in my, uh, in my career. Back then in 2009, there were six international organizations that came together when we met in Kuala Lumpur. We decided there is something that we need to do to create a consistent standard we need to share knowledge so that we can bring together our minds and our thoughts to establish something that we can speak on the same wavelength. We can see, speak with the same vocabulary. And I'm glad that FIG uh, was involved in that uh, declaration. And uh, I was then the vice president of RICS. And together we came and we signed that declaration and over the last 20 years, little did we know that there is such a drive, there is such a demand across the globe for a consistency in comparing cost. You know, today we find there is a cross flow of funds for investment in real estate, in infrastructure facilities. You know, just in 2017, an estimate of close to 14 billion was transacted across the globe for purpose of investment in real estate. And in the construction industry, in 2017, we find that about $10.5 trillion, and that has now increased to 2022, which is not far away, and is estimated it would increase to about $12.5 trillion US dollar. Over this week, I have heard and I've seen a massive investment in infrastructure right here in Turkey. We heard about one of the largest airports that's going to come on board. We hear about many bridges that's going to be built uh, in this very country itself. And so we find also here that there are massive in investment in China on railways, on power station, and also some of the more developed countries like United States of America, some of their infrastructure are now failing and the new president, Trump, is now thinking about how to replace some of the infrastructure. And so there are massive investment in infrastructure. Now, I want to show this uh, photograph that speaks of the reality of the construction industry today. This particular project, a power generation project, is located in the United Kingdom. But it is funded by Chinese investors. And who is going to operate and construct it? It's the French. And so you can see there is now a cross fertilization. No one country, no one nationality is going to take ownership. It's going to be a cross collaborative efforts between the different parts of the world. And therefore, it is very important for us to speak with the same language. And so why they are so important? Because it is important that we know what cost is all about and what constitutes the construction cost so that we can compare item with item, similar item with item, so we can accurately assess value for money. You have just heard from the, uh, the speaker before me, the great advancement in technology. But one of the most driving, important driving factors in construction is money, is cost. And therefore, it's important for us to create value for money for all our investment, for all our construction projects. We also want to have a consistent methodology 
in terms of assessing, evaluating, and benchmarking costs. In my own country, from Malaysia, we now are constructing a railway from the west coast, a port, right across to the east coast of the peninsula of Malaysia. And now, the first estimate they came out was only about 29 billion Malaysian ringgit. And now we find that the contract was awarded at 55 billion ringgit. So we, we are asking, we, who is giving out the right number, the right figure? And so we find these kind of issues which are often debated by both the policy makers, by the government of the day, and the taxpayers. There's always going to be a great debate between investors and the one who's going to build. So that is going to be a great contention. So because of the lack of standards, the lack of consistency in the way we report costs. Now, these are some of the examples where cost has been overrun. And often we find in mega projects, other cost has been greatly inflated for one reason or another, or where there is no control over the cost. And that's why you find often at the end of the project, when you start calculating what is the uh, end price, they often go way beyond the original budget that was given. And not only that, we also see that construction costs, when it's not managed properly, often result in disputes. It often dis result in bringing the parties to court or to arbitration. And these are often a uh, uh, very negative implication to the industry. It costs time, it costs money to resolve disputes between the parties concerned. And these are some of the examples we find not only has this taken a longer time to resolve, but it is also costing a lot of money. And this money could have well spent in development rather than going to the lawyers and, and, and dispute. So it is so important for us to have a, a cost. So standards are necessary. But what are the standards we have today? Every country say, I have a standard. But they all talk about differently. And therefore, it is important for us uh, to have a standard that cut across the globe. And henceforth, we find we need to have a global standard that provides consistency across the globe. The inability to compare project costs when there is no standard. And therefore, it will create investment risks. It will create lack of transparency. You know, in some countries where there is no transparency, there is no openness, and where there is no tender involved, and you often create that kind of problem. So it will lead to sometimes underinvestment, it leads to cost and time overruns. This is where we find the problems today. And so, what are the aims and objectives of ICMS? What we want to create is that there is a template upon which costs can be measured, costs can be reported, and costs can be identified. And where there are variances, we can identify what are the causes of those variances between the projects. And so that we can make an informed decision to the investors. And all of us, many of us, particularly involved in the infrastructure projects, we are all taxpayers. We want to know where the money are being spent. And therefore, it's important for us to have that standard. So data can therefore be used with confidence and so that when the funding agencies, where the banks are involved, they can provide the financing with great confidence and assurance that the, the, the amount that has been pleaded for is the right number and the right figure. And so it is important for us to have a standard. And who will definitely benefit from a global standard? Anybody, any stakeholders involved in the construction, whether directly or indirectly, will benefit from it. And those who are investing in, the great investors, particularly in huge investment projects, will know that the money they are parting with, the money they are putting, will have the yield and the returns that they are looking for. And so financial institutions which are providing funding will know that there is a basis for assessing the project uh, financing needs 
and so that they can make that assessment to be able to, uh, to provide the loans or the financing for that particular project. And the general public, the taxpayers, will, will, will have that benefit as well. You enjoy the benefit knowing you are creating value for your money, knowing that you are helping to increase the GDPs of your nation. Back in 2015, as I said, you know, we started the idea in 2009 in Kuala Lumpur, and it came to fruition in 2015, where at that time, 17 organizations from across the world came together, we met at, at the IMF, and we come together to set up the ICMS coalition. And so it is uh, a group of professional organizations coming to, from different countries, and uh, Today, we have more than 40 uh, organizations across the globe. They are now part of the uh, of ICMS coalition. They are all member uh, associations, and if you uh, take into the membership of each organization, probably we are looking into something that is close to half a million members across the globe. And I was at that uh, meeting representing FIG, and uh, we have many, some of them who are uh, in, in that meeting who are present here. Today, we have something, 44 organizations from across the group uh, who are part of this coalition. And this map which shows from the different region, we have strong representation from different parts of the five continents and including some global organizations such as FIG, which are part of this coalition. Now, the structure in which, upon which we have, uh, we have the uh, trustee board which provide the overall governance and take ownership of the standard. And then the, the trustee board would then devolve the standard setting to the standard setting committee. We are independent. The, the trustee board does not interfere with our work because the standard setting are comprising of experts from across the world region. And I, I'm privileged to chair that uh, standard setting committee. And we receive comments, we receive uh, ideas from the different uh, contributors across the globe. I must say that at the very beginning of my work in the standard second, it was very difficult because different people got different ideas what the standard is going to be. And so my role as a chairman would have to have a patience and a listening ear so that I can hear, I do not pass judgment, I do not say your standard is better, your idea is better. I try to bring everybody's idea together. And then I decipher it, I sieve it through. Then I present it to the committee and say, this is what the main issues that we are dealing with. And I'm glad that by the time we met in the 2016, and we thank the European Commission for hosting us at, at, in Brussels, and everybody come together with that, that consensus of mind. And I was so uh, privileged because we started, within such a short time, we are able to establish the framework upon which the standard uh, ought to be. Set. So this is where we were when we met uh, in the Brussels, I think in March 2016. And very quickly after that, we came out with the first draft we, 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 of, the, uh, of the standard, and then we are able to, I'll talk to you more about uh, the, the, the journey that we went through. Now, this slide tells us upon which, how we organize ourselves. We are very conscious of the fact that we need to engage with the existing standard across, we do not want to reinvent the wheel, such as the IPMS. Some of you who are property surveyors here, the IPMS establishes the standard for measurement of floor areas, both the gross and the net floor areas for the different types of buildings. And we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We say we will follow the standard by IPMS. We are also conscious of the United Standard uh, a classification for infrastructure. You know, we also want to use that as a basis for classification of the different types of uh, infrastructure projects. We are also conscious of the fact, you have just heard about digitization, about BIM, about building information modeling, and the trend towards technology. What we want to say is the standards will be able to enable the technology to be able to capture the data, particularly on construction costs. 
And so it has, we are very conscious of that in the way that we format and we draft our standard. It must be enabling for technology to be able to use it and apply it and so that it will create efficiency and, and also in terms of time, expediency in the way we wrote out our, uh, our cost report. And so this is how we have went. We have the steering group. We provide, I chair the steering group because we need to narrow down and, uh, and then I will direct how matters ought to progress as it goes. And this is the journey that we went through. The first uh, draft for public consultation went off uh, in the, uh, online uh, in the internet on November 20, 2016. And then this, we felt it was necessary for the second uh, uh, draft for public consultation and that rolled out in March 2017. And this is where we were uh, when we met in, uh, for the public consultation and uh, we met together with the trustee board uh, in London uh, in 2016. And here we are. We completed the standard. We published it in July 2017. And this is the result of collaborative work uh, from the experts. So within a period of less than two years, we are able to roll out these standards. And this was a historical moment when we met on the back of the uh, Asia-Pacific uh, Association of Quantity Surveyors Congress in Vancouver, in Canada. Uh, last year, uh, we launched these standards, uh, which has now been rolled out uh, across the globe. It's now available online. Uh, it is free of charge. You, you can download the standards. Uh, just visit the website, which I will show you later. Uh, very quickly, without being going into too technical about standard, we are very clear that the standards ought to be simple to adopt, particularly from many countries who do not have standards. We are very conscious of that. And we try to make it as simple as possible, even the vocabulary. And some of us who have been trained in Britain or the, under the Commonwealth country, we use certain terminology which cannot be understood by people in the continental Europe or some of the uh, uh, Asian countries, for example. And so we have come to use words such as cost group, cost subgroup, and people could understand. And so what we have done is that we divided the standard into four levels. Firstly, the level one is talk about the different classification of the type of projects. So we have building project as one, and then we have another 11 uh, infrastructure projects, which we feel at this time can cover almost every infrastructure projects that we can uh, think of. Obviously, there are some which you feel they're not, but we can tell them how to use the standard uh, where uh, we, we, we can apply uh, the, the different types of project. And the project can also form as a sub-project. We know that certain projects has got multiple types of projects. Let's say a railway project, you have tunneling work. You also have bridges. You also have buildings for the terminals or the, or the depots. So there are different types, uh, a combination of projects. But the project is a railway project. But yeah, it consists of different types of work. So we also uh, have... Con Level 2 talks about the cost category. At the moment, we are looking at only the capital costs and the associated capital costs. There were discussion about bringing in life cycle costing, but we felt at the first instance, in order for the standard to be adopted, we need to deal with the most urgent, that is the capital cost. Obviously, I'll be talking about the way forward where we are going to look at life cycle costing as well uh, in, 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 in the standard. And at the level three, it is a cost group. And some of us from UK or Commonwealth countries, these are the elements or the elemental costs Break down, And then when we talk about level four, it is what are the further breakdown, a further cost subgroups. Let's say you talk about foundation, you have the subgroup like piling, earthworks, or the retaining walls, right? Those are under cost subgroups. We have intentionally made uh, level four as, as non-compulsory. Uh, we only want the major because we want to give flexibility to national organization and, and, and uh, 
uh, institutions to develop their own measurement standard. And one of the things that we felt that we are not replacing any standard or method of measurement that each of the national associations is that we want to give them the flexibility to develop their own measurement standard, but they must comply with the high-level standards that ICMS has provided. And so this is the way that we have, we have intentionally uh, and, and purposely uh, uh, framed uh, in, in such a way. And so this is where we are. Level one, two, and three are mandatory. Uh, in the, and uh, also, but level four is discretionary. But we also give guidance how they should do level four as well. But it is uh, discretionary. And this is the hierarchy, as I said, there are projects which may involve different sub-projects, but it's one project. Then you have cost category, the cost group, and the cost uh, subgroups itself. And again, uh, I mentioned earlier on about the UNSCI code and classification, and we try to converge with the existing standards that is now available uh, in, in the industry. Now, in level one, for purpose of comparing costs, we need to have the project attributes, which deals with the characteristic of the, each type of building and the timing upon which the tender or the price has been captured at that time. And so it also provides the location and also provides certain features, whether you are building on existing uh, brownfield where you need a lot of uh, infra, uh, uh, site preparation work, or it is on a greenfield where you need to bring in all the existing facilities and so on. So these are issues which will affect costs, and that will be reflected in the project attributes. And then we also project, provide project values, which provide the standard set of descriptions of measurement for each type of project attributes. There are two main uh, project categories I already mentioned. I will not go into that. And... Um, I also mentioned the cost in yield, life cycle costing, will not included in the first edition of the standard, but it will be included in the second edition, which we are currently working on. Now, for the use of the standards, the global investment, as I said, will be important. They use a the standard for international, national, and regional uh, bodies. They can use that for cost comparison. You can use it within your nation itself, you know, between the different regions and for big countries like China or the state, United States of America, this standard can compare between the different uh, regions as well. It also enables feasibility studies and development appraisals to be made for cost planning, cost control, and cost analysis and cost modeling uh, to be established as well. It also can help in dispute resolution, uh, particularly when you uh, try to define what constitute the scope within the contract and the standard will provide what ought to be comprised within uh, the, 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 uh, a particular project. It also can be used for reinstatement of, of projects or refurbishment of old buildings and for purpose also for purpose of insurance as well. Uh, for valuation and liabilities of assets. Okay? Now, over the last few months, we find that some of the major firms across the globe are beginning, some of these multinational companies are beginning to uh, adopt ICMS. They are changing their SOPs, they are changing their, the way that they do work, and they are beginning to use ICMS as a standard upon which they will report costs to, to their clients. So this is, uh, and the numbers are growing by the day. And, sorry, and this is one of the first uh, outcome when the, the Irish government would like to compare the cost of residential building between uh, the re different European countries. And they are appointed one of the consultants in Ireland, and they said you must use ICMS as a base upon which those costs are to be reported. So this, uh, this is actually just come out from, uh, from, from the printing shop, and it is uh, still very fresh. And uh, uh, so I thought that this is important for us uh, to know about you know, the, the outcome of, of the standard. Finally, how will ICMB be adopted? Every coalition uh, member of ICMB will now, because they have signed up to the declaration, 
and they are beginning to look at their own standards, their measurement standards, and how they can amend it or modify or tweak it so that it will fall in line uh, with the uh, ICMS standards. Many organizations will also incorporate within the existing standard and guidance and provide, for example, RICS are already amending their NRM, the new um, measurement, uh, uh, stand, new rules of measurement to incorporate ICMS as well. Government and businesses will also adopt ICMS in the market, but we find we, when we are starting to talk to the, uh, the Emirates of, uh, in Dubai, and they also say they want to adopt the, 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 the Public Works Ministry, say they want to use ICMS as a basis upon which costs are to report it. Funding agencies, we are, I mentioned about uh, the IMF, who are very supportive of this project, and World Bank, which would eventually demand before fundings are provided to some of the emerging economies, they would like costs to be reported based on uh, ICM. So there's a lot going to be a lot of pool factors uh, going forward. Uh, and how can you be involved? Firstly, join the coalition if your, your organization is not part of the uh, uh, ICMS coalition. If you are a private sector, you can use. If you are academia, you can train, you can teach your students uh, what ICMS is all about. And you can, for those who are vendors on the technology, you can also look at the standard and how your technology can converge and come in line with the uh, standards that we are talking about. And so, the way ahead for us, we already began the work on the second edition, and it will incorporate life cycle costing because the European Commission uh, has told us from the beginning they would like to know not just the initial cost of a project, they want to know the entire cost of project over its lifetime, economic lifetime. And so it's important for us to incorporate life cycle costing. We, we have purposely put the word life cycle costing rather than whole life costing or cost in use because we want to leave out the financing part because some part of a project involves financing and we do not want that because it can be very complicated because different uh, projects have got different types of financing and so we have just dealt with the uh, cost of maintenance and, and upkeeping of the, of the building uh, uh, in, in, in the life cycle costing and so the word life cycle costing was intentional and there may be additional categories for civil engineering that we may be add on but we are depending on feedback from the industry we are, which we are uh, hoping to. And our timeline for this is that we hope uh, to roll out the first draft for public consultation by the end of this year. Um, we will be meeting, I'll be meeting the Standard Setting Committee in June in London, and we hope at that meeting we will agree on the framework and very quickly we are able to roll out the, the first draft for public consultation, hopefully when we meet again in Sydney in November uh, this year. And God willing, we will be able to, to get uh, the second uh, edition of ICM incorporating life cycle costing in the second half of 2019. That is our plan, and I hope that you uh, will look forward and you want to follow our progress. Please visit our website, icms-coalition.org. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Cillian. Thank you for an excellent presentation. We move on to the third presenter. Uh, this will be given by uh, Professor Charles Toff. It's a short introduction. Uh, he's a research professor in the Department of Civil and Env Environmental and Genetic Engineering, Ohio State University in the US. His research interests and expertise cover broad areas of spatial information sciences and systems. Published over 350 peer-reviewed journal and proceedings papers, recipients of numerous awards. Uh, currently, he serves as the uh, ISPRS second vice president. It's an honor to have you here. Please. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's always a big pleasure and honor to participate in the FIG Congress. Also, I know that this is not the welcoming ceremony, but still, I'm officially representing the International Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, so I would like to convey warm wishes and success to this meeting. As we know, the two sister societies are working 
very closely together and both of them are serving the societies and both organizations are serving the national societies and indirectly improving the lives of every citizen on earth. So, um, my talk is about smart cities and then mobility and a little bit autonomous navigation and being the second uh, speaker in the plenary sessions, obviously there are overlaps with the previous one, but I think it's good because all of us has a little bit different take. So I have three major elements. One is the smart city and the mobility, and then trends, how the, the smart city developments relate to general trends in the geospatial, science and engineering, practically surveying and mapping. And then the last part is a new way of data acquisition crowdsourcing, which is gaining more traction, so it needs some attention. So we heard in the third plenary yesterday, I think a quite decent wrap up of smart cities. So in a nutshell, oh, it goes faster. Um, what we want to achieve is to use state of art technology to its fullest potential to improve life in urban areas. And it clearly depends on one thing, data, data sharing. We heard in the first presentation the importance of this. And with respect to us, there are three elements. Oops, that's really fast. Connectivity, uh, which means a little bit more than just connecting anything physically, but connection between a medical record, a traffic pattern, traffic flow, or a residence, or something like that. So it should be defined very broadly. An important element for us is the spatial temporal context. Uh, the life in the city is very busy, goods, people, information are moving, and therefore it's not only the location, but also the time tag, so everything is geotagged if you like. And another aspect is that conventional methods usually cannot handle the amount of data or the information. I mean, cities have already sophisticated information systems, the point that they are not connected, there is no sharing. So big data offers a technology uh, which takes care of it, if you like. Of course, this is also evolving, so we are not yet at the end. Um, an ideal, we heard that uh, smart city is defined in very many ways, depending on the implementation or a pilot project, but generally the idea is what everybody agrees is that you have a zero uh, carbon footprint type of settings, which means you have to use renewable energies, you have, you have to harvest solar or wind power, and then of course, usually it's not generated when the peak usage is, so you have to make some buffering, some batteries and other things. Now, if you move to the infrastructure, the residential areas, the single family homes are expected to have zero balance, power balance, so they collect enough energy, so they need some buffering. Obviously, it cannot be applied to the uh, community, industry, or business buildings. Their size is different, but still, smart infrastructure is in expected to improve the way how we use energy in buildings, uh, lighting, heating, AC, and so forth. Now, uh, the next element is probably the mobility, the vehicles moving, since if you want to have zero, then uh, zero carbon footprint, then you have to have electrified uh, vehicles moving. Of course, this is an ideal thing and, and nobody is close to that. Um, strong developments expected that like in terms of spending one and a half trillion dollars will be spent by 2020. It's, I know it's less than 10% of the building construction industry, but it's like more like one and a half times the GDP of Turkey, for example. And then you see some cities and I step over this. Now, um, Columbus, the city where I live, won a federal grant to start a pilot project on smart cities. We got $50 million from the federal government and that was matched with local industry and so forth. So this is like a $100 million investment in the city infrastructure. And obviously it's not enough to make the whole city smart, but it's enough to start like four targeted projects and in four areas, so one is about the public transportation, how to optimize, the second is the general mobility, every element of the transportation keeping people moving 
by cars or on bicycles and anything else. And then also the ease, how you can handle and navigate through the city. And the fourth element is start the electrification process by the public transportation and so forth. Four areas have been selected and uh, residential, commercial, and then downtown and uh, more like industrial logistics areas. And um, oops, this, I think it gives a little bit of challenge, excuse me. So that shows the four areas where the tests have, tests have started and it's a small part of the city, but still it's significant. The downtown area, a fairly, right, fairly large residential area, then the larger shopping center, and then an intermodal uh, base where lots of goods are arriving, and then they should be uh, moved up, let's say, to the shopping center, and all the shuttle lines are shown here, which are supposed to be autonomously run. So, Let's see what the objectives are. So the first element in the residential center is to improve uh, the mobility of people from point A to point B. Now it's fairly well covered if you use public transportation, you go to the bus stop and you go to the closest bus stop, let's say at the medical center. So the concept here is that they want to make sure that the whole system is in lessly integrated at the beginning, the first mile or first kilometer, if you like, and the last is covered. So if you arrive to a place like this big convention center or a medical facility, you have to get oriented inside, and that poses challenges. So that's the emphasis, and also there is a little bit of increase emphasis on supporting elderly and physically, mentally handicapped people, because as we know in the developed world, uh, people are, I mean, the societies are aging. Um, the scenario is a little bit different for the commercial. It's more about moving people between buildings and uh, parking lots. And that shows around the shopping center, the seven shuttle lines planned uh, in the coming years. One is tested in the summer, this summer. Um, downtown presents a different scenario. In downtown, usually there is not enough parking. That's what everybody says. So. You want to have kind of a smart parking management whereby you dynamically control the parking spaces, even the prices, also make room for the deliveries and so forth. And finally, the fourth element is this uh, track platooning that you want to move the goods from the arrival to the distribution areas. And you can think about that trucks are lined up like a train, except there is no physical connection, there is only uh, connectivity through wireless connection and it has many aspects, load, optimization and clearance. Okay, so let's move to the smart mobility. Now that's defined a little bit broader than just moving physical objects. So that means information and anything mobility in terms of how people change jobs and all the other things. And um, in terms of the transportation element, which is of highest interest at the moment, there is a so-called triple zero objectives. You would like to have zero accidents and fatalities. You know, if you use autonomous vehicles, the computers may make mistakes, but they are very patient. They don't have ego, so they are not stressed out. So if the system works, there should not be any accidents. Uh, electrification, electric power vehicles will obviously work in the carbon footprint, and then if all this works, then people will be less stressed out, and one element on this one is that it saves lives, less elements, and also it supports people with challenges, physical and others. But of course, there are other aspects of life. The transportation is still growing because of the urbanization. We want to maintain the environmental sustainability and the same applies to the economic sustainability. We cannot afford to lose on that front. Now to commute, it's a picture from the 50s when there was no computer, no smartphone, no cameras, nothing. Still people anticipated that if you have some markings on the road, somehow this vehicle would be able to follow it. Um, of course, things change since then. Our expectation is a little bit different by now, so you need more comfort and so forth. And the challenge is here that traffic goes, so the vehicle miles or vehicle kilometers travels will continue to increase. 
pollution is still around, urban sprawl, we are occupying bigger areas, bigger space to move, inequity, wealth is not equally distributed, roadways are saturated and so forth. Now the next thing is positioning and navigation. Probably surveyors think in the static world historically, but by now I think you understand that many objects are moving and you want to model this. So that's the difference between navigation and positioning in very simple terms. Now geoink is a favorite word in the US and that stands for anything positioning or navigation plus some intelligence. So some actionable information, what you can do with the data. You anticipate that something will happen somewhere. So it's clear that GPS is the infrastructure here. And then, of course, in open areas, I'm sorry if this is a little bit, in open areas, um, you can assume that you have both the position and the time. And then first, the relative navigation of the vehicles, which may not be or actually it's not yet autonomous navigation, but still can prevent uh, accidents just by warning if you get too close to somewhere. Uh, of course, autonomous navigation is the classical use whereby you absolutely position the vehicle uh, on the road, but it's not good enough to keep, let's say, the vehicle moving the center of the lane, so therefore you need some local things like using pavement markings and optical sensing and also the same technologies good for uh, collision avoidance. Location-based services, similarly big business in the cities, and um, you think about smart design infrastructure, which is also based that the buildings are designed properly, and also they have the sensing capability to figure out deformations or a bridge is about to collapse and situations like that. Again, it's a topic on its own. So in summary, positioning and communication are the two essential elements of the smart mobility. Now let's look at where autonomous vehicle navigation is. Uh, first of all, it started much before smart cities or smart mobility got invented. And this is driven by the fact that we humans are the most dangerous things on roads. So yearly we lose 1.3 billion people on the roads and there are bigger numbers when people get injured and some of them are uh, I mean, life uh, staying for their life. So that's, that's a major force. In the US, recent statistics shows like 37,000. Historically, it used to be like 60,000 in the 50s, 60s. Then it went down because of the increased regulation and car technology safety improved. Uh, by now, it's again increasing, and probably you can guess why, because everybody is using smartphones during driving. So that's, that's very responsible, but that's Goes, and of course, there is some dollar amount here too. So where the accidents happen, this is in obviously our neighborhood, our home, where this is we drive the most. And also this is the area we don't pay enough attention because uh, we are very accustomed, we are very comfortable. If a traffic sign changes, chances are that people overlook it. And we spend quite a bit of time on roads. So, um, how, how is, what is the state of the art in autonomous navigation? Many companies, big car companies, startups, internet giants are investing heavily into this. For us, the important thing is that if you want to improve the safety, then you need high definition data. You know where you are driving because then you can easily, easier locate the vehicle and then you can focus on uh, identifying the moving objects around the vehicles. And this information is not yet available. There are many GIS CAD systems, but it's not organized and there is no communication. And crowdsourcing, I will talk about later, is a component which is contributing to these things. And also, there is a definition of different autonomy levels. And again, I don't go through it. It's, I guess, widely understood. We are probably at level two, maybe some incursions to level three. So. On a good freeway, you can drive an hour without putting your hands on the steering wheel, and you may give a little bit of attention to the road, but you are actually not focused. You should be ready if the system alerts you take over the control. So I think it's a remarkable thing, but we are really far from the full automation. So 
When it started 10 years ago, DARPA organized a grand challenge, and the first start, as you see this vehicle, had a hard time to get started, right? The other vehicle had to make a left turn, and it arrived to a junction. It stopped, and it was watching for passing vehicles. And it passed one, then it decided to go when there was another passing vehicle, and bang. So, so that was 10 years ago. If you look at the right side, what Google can do, the Waymo company, that's quite impressive. First of all, you have the background map behind, and then you see that how nicely the vehicle stays in the lanes, negotiates obstacles, and then in general keeps an eye all the moving elements. So that's a remarkable development. All right, so let's move on to our technologies. Surveying is probably the oldest engineering profession, and airborne surveying is fairly young, like 100 years plus. And these two communities coexisted very nicely, very little interaction in between. But as technology, the digital era arrived like 20, 25 years, GPS became full constellation, then things started to change. Oh, excuse me. And mobile mapping, but invented, which came from both sides, surveying and mapping, and uh, one of the first vehicles, you see GPS, some IMU and cameras, but back then, 20 plus years ago, nobody was ready to handle this. The governments liked the idea, but the system was not operational. So it stayed a business, but it really did not make too much traction. The major change happened 10, 15 years ago when the internet giants recognized that Mapping is extremely important, and this was the beginning of the location-based services. So within a few years, they deployed thousands of mobile mappers, cameras, later uh, scanners, and then um, I think whoever is here probably, chances are that they use one of the mapping, either Google Maps or anything else, uh, to navigate. So what's the difference then to autonomous driving? Uh, that we eliminate the driver and we put in a system which takes care of the thinking for a shuttle or for a vehicle. So that means that there is a sort of a convergence between these two fields. And just to demonstrate it more, I show some of the geometrics technologies. It's not a full picture, but still, uh, the yellow ones are shared by both communities, the surveyors and, and the mappers. Like terrestrial LIDAR is, is very inherent to surveying, and UAS is also. Now, um, as an example, here is the very nice LiDAR picture of the Bay Bridge from San Francisco. Someone can ask what kind of LiDAR technologies, technology was used to capture. Probably chances are that you would say it was a terrestrial laser scanner because it's very detailed, you see the light post. If I show the whole picture, then it's clear that this is from an airborne survey. But still, it's remarkable dance. Okay, let's move on to, oops. Um, platforms and sensors. We have seen very significant changes in the past 20 years. On the platform force in the middle, uh, UAS established itself as a technology, and on the ground, uh, personal navigation, push cards uh, became very popular. So many people navigate just by smartphones and, um, and similar things. And now, uh, the, you know, I mean, moving forward to the sensor changes, historically there used to be two groups. The navigation sensors, where GPS is the major workhorse, IMU gives some attitude, and then some other classical sensors, and the imaging sensors. And they were like two separate groups, but not anymore because uh, you hardly can find a navigation device without some vision system. If you navigate on the road, obviously you have GPS, you walk into a building or go of some structure when there is no GPS reception, the best thing you can do is probably using some imaging to support your navigation needs. Similarly, <clears throat> the sensors were, which are priced by a little bit proportional to the object range satellite Sensors are the most expensive, airborne are fairly expensive, and the ground, on the ground things can get inexpensive. So those uh, sensors are also coming with georeferencing, so there is no single sensor. All the sensors are used in a sensor-integrated network. 
and probably the best example is the smartphone of this integration which has GPS, then nine parameter, IMU system, all the communication, data network, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, short range, whatever you want, cameras and other sensors. So this, this became really an essential tool, not only for, let's say, for geospatial data acquisition, but also as an interface, as we have seen. You can control your smart home, you can open the door, you can set the thermostat, and so forth. Now comes crowdsourcing. Um, so let's look at what is in our packet, right? We already talked about the smartphone. We can add smartwatch. Digital cameras are a little bit losing grants against smart uh, phones because for social events, I mean, the smartphones are taking really fairly good pictures. So if Facebook is your objective, then you are fine. Um, Similarly, recreational GPS is losing a little bit ground because smartphones in a city environment are just much better. You can listen to music, you are still connected if you want to be connected. But this decline is offset a little bit by the wearable technologies. We want to monitor our fitness level, so heart rate monitor, oxygenation, and so forth. Then car navigation, 10 years ago, luxury cars started to use built-in dashboard navigation system, GPS systems. Well, it started to change recently that this increase that cars are coming with built in GPS is the standard because what uh, people want is just an interface and they want to use their smartphone which provides the connection. The map data in the smartphone is always up to date and it always gets the real-time traffic information. And of course, social networks. So all in all, what we experience that we leave digital footprints, at this moment it's just location and no thematic information if you like. So depending on settings, we are georeferenced and provide information. If we go to the local uh, mobile carrier uh, center and they ask, let's say, where I spent the evening, they can figure out not only where I was between 7 and 10 o'clock yesterday, but they can easily tell me what these 180 people who were with me at this uh, uh, foundation dinner in the southwest corner of the museum. So, question. Uh, we see two maps here. They show Manhattan and Newark, and as you see, the green Newark is denser, while in the red, Manhattan is denser. So what's the difference between the two maps? All right, the interest of time iPhone uses Android, right? This area, the southern part of Manhattan is more affluent, I mean, stock market, money, insurance, and so forth. Now, how about another challenge? This is, again, Columbus. You see two heat maps, and they are similar, of course, the structure, but still different. You see more roads. There are less roads, so what could be the difference? Okay, so that's exercise, running, and bicycling. For running a smaller area, five kilometers, few kilometers, okay, so in a neighborhood you can run in the streets. If you bicycle, you don't want to make short distances and always turn, you want to reach out. It has also very many information, of course, I mean, we look at the location and the exercise, but for example, there are econo social, econo econo social aspects, like these areas are, look like that non-existent, like both. Areas. Now, some of them could be industry, but I, we know it's not. These are just economically dis, dis, uh, depressed areas. So, uh, where the poverty is an issue, people usually don't care about exercise, while in the affluent neighborhoods, they do care. Um, last element is that, uh, was also a little bit mentioned, that UAS is still not a crowdsourcing device, but UAS is widely used for hobby purpose, except people cannot easily fly about cities, so there is some regulation, but this is an example of my university, the Ohio State, the famous stadium, that's how a university is defined in the US, that's the center. And this is, this data set was acquired, and uh, that's actually, it's not important. What is important, that was processed without any human interaction. So there is no cleaning, and still it looks quite reasonable. So this is how it comes out from the, computer. If you do cleaning and editing, you can make it really nice. And if you would zoom in, I show. And uh, to close on the first 
uh, but this has the potential to use image information, texture, as opposed to just the location, what I have demonstrated. And if someone is interested in the topic, there was this famous project building Rome in a day, when from crowdsourced data, the whole city 3D model generated. So uh, in terms of trends, um, it's, we have like one smartphone for three citizens on Earth and in like good 12 years it will be one-on-one -on -one ratio. And then, I mean, the growth rate of GNSS was like 21% in the past five years, so that expected to stay. Now, interesting things, the application as we alluded to it, transportation and LBS are the winners, and then as always, the profession, the surveying profession is only 4%, which is understandable uh, if you consider the vast uh, consumer markets. Now, in the developed world, um, as you see in certain areas, it's already leveling out Europe and the North America, but the other part is very strong. So the last few minutes are about autonomous navigation and the crowdsourcing. So why a vehicle is different from a smartphone? Because the smartphone has the camera, but usually you keep in your packets, your uh, case or somewhere else, so you, you cannot have a constant view. Why for vehicles, it's just mandated. You want to always look at the neighborhood to achieve safe navigation. So in an ideal system, you can have like four different type of sensors, and that shows the field of view what a vehicle may observe. Now for real vehicles, I included the Tesla, uh, field of use, which has seven cameras, as you see, three cameras provides for the front, and then uh, different technology for the Google Waymo car, which has a powerful laser scanner and just only one camera. Now, it's important to point out that Tesla is the one until now has not worked with maps, but the Cadillac ST6 has a high definition map. They mapped like 130,000 miles of divided highways in the US, plus they use RTK, so it's not only a single frequency code-based GPS solution, but they have a better solution, and they also use road information. So what we see, this is a test from our mobile mapping vehicle. You see side, front, and the center is the LiDAR. Uh, what we can do with this data, if we do just a simple navigation like an open parking space, then you can figure out the trajectory and connect once you see the same features. To make it more challenging, as you see, one smartphone was upside down, but still the features connect. So, I mean, you, you see the strengths in a way the imaging if the object space has at least some texture. Now, um, we had laser scanners on this vehicle, so for a section in the campus area, hop, we used uh, this 360-degree uh, Velodyne scanner, which provides a relatively nice but low-level uh, point cloud of the area. If you add the side scanners, then you can restore uh, very nice. You know, if you have this surface, a 3D models available, then you can focus on really on the moving targets, the objects, then you navigate. So, of course, it's not totally shows the same uh, point cloud, but anyway, so this is the object that you want to identify those and track those. Of course, um, it looks easy in a normal situation, but there are challenges on the sensing size. You come out from an underpass, then so suddenly the brightness changes, and regardless of the sensor developments, it's not simple. Then there are parking cars. You don't know whether they are queued up before a traffic, si a traffic light or something like that. There are pedestrians, bicycles. So these are the three elements usually you look forward. Now, the system works fairly well, but no algorithm is perfect. So this is an example when this standing bicyclist is taken as a pedestrian and a bicyclist. So that's an error which is probably not causing too much trouble. However, if you look at this picture, when this vehicle is not identified, that's the real trouble, and then we have seen incidents when a white vehicle was not noticed and so forth. 
So ultimately, if you collect all this data and integrate, then you get to this crowdsourcing solution that you create maps. Here it shows just one trajectory, but the idea is that this trajectory may be course reaccurate or moderate reaccurate, but if you drive many vehicles, then chances are that you can average and figure out what the center line and also have a fairly good estimate where the buildings are and so forth. Error cancellation works nice. So that brings me to the conclusion. So um, the key element for the smart cities, again, the connectivity and then the sharing the data and the information. And again, the geospatial element is very essential. Everything is time tagged. Um, the data handling is, is a problem on its own and uh, data, um, data science is the discipline which addresses this and within the data analytics, deep learning, convolutional networks are the technologies which are rapidly developing. And uh, smart mobility is probably the element of a smart city which can be implemented probably at the shortest time. Going totally green in a smart city is probably not realistic in a short term. So there are three less generic observations is that we see a continuing proliferation of sensors, so more and more sensors will be deployed, and not only on moving objects like vehicles, but also on buildings on the static part of the world. So the uh, data acquisition for crowdsourcing will increase, and as I said, the accuracy and uh, privacy also, in particular, the EU introduced this new GDPR uh, law is important. Now, clear, which is good for our profession, that autonomous vehicles need high-definition maps and reference to those maps, which comes from this community. And in the long run, it's fair to say that, as I showed in the previous slide, that these vehicles travel in the area where they have to be autonomously navigated. So more they travel, the chances are that they can map it the best. Does it mean that there won't be any professional mapping? No, because the vehicles are driving on the road and there are many other things, rural areas and outside of the road network. So with this one, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Charles, for a very interesting presentation. Could, could I ask the three presenters to come up on stage? And could I also ask Oran, the, the president of the Turkish Chamber, to come up? We would like to thank the... Uh, I think we'll give some gifts. We'd like to thank the, the presenters. First, I would like to see... Uh, we'd like to thank the, the presenters with a, a small gift, or a gift from the... Uh, Thanks very much. ...from the organizers. To, to show our appreciation for, for your for, for taking the time to come here and give these three excellent presentations. And while doing that, could you please join me in a, in a round of applause for these three excellent presentations? And also, thank you very much. And also, there are some uh, housekeeping announcements just before the coffee break. But thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would just like to draw your attention now to, I know that the coffee is drawing, but two seconds. This, today we have in total 18 technical sessions, so there should be enough to choose between. We also have the Director General Forum. Oh. 
Uh, we have the uh, Member Association Forum, and there is also the Corporate Members Meeting. Here too, we have four partners sessions, Fit for Purpose session together with the UN Habitat and GLTN, value-based property taxes together with World Bank, and Turkish-speaking and mid-Asian countries workshop. And I want to announce, please, that this meeting has been changed to another room, to Uskun.3, which is this room here. And the session that should have been here, technical session 3H, is moved to Macca Hall on the other side. And then we have two young surveyor sessions also. And please also note that we today have our Platinum member session, uh, which today is LICA. Tonight at 5.30 after the last session, you can, visit, you can go to the Commission annual meetings and I will encourage you to uh, go find one of the commissions and go to their meeting. They will have a dinner afterwards. And if you want to join the dinner, please go to the information desk at the escalators and you will get information about the dinners. Then, as last thing, we have previously announced that we have the FIG Foundation. If you would like to give a donation to the foundation, please find one from FIG office. And here on the photo, you can see the five persons who were selected to attend this Congress. Thank you so much for now, and have a pleasant day.